It's been four years. So we read the Bible verse first. First Peter chapter five, verse seven. First Peter chapter five, verse seven. Thank you so much for flying my family out here to come and be with you all this morning. I'm still going to go on about Skyline. The Skyline was so good yesterday. Even, even if the Lord doesn't bless this morning, I'm telling you, it was worth it for me. It was worth it. No, I just, I just tease. And I know the Lord will bless. And uh, what a blessing it is uh, to be here. What verse did I say again? I forgot already. 5-7. Thank you. 1 Peter 5, 7. All right, so we're going to read one verse here, and uh, we'll go into more, but let's read 1 Peter 5, 7, and then we'll ask for the Lord's blessing. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Let's pray. Dear Father, you know that I'm not worthy to uh, stand in this pulpit and to preach the gospel. None of us are. None of us are worthy to handle your word and to... Um, try to expound the deep truths of the Bible. And so, Lord, I beg you to please send the Holy Spirit to be our comforter, to be our teacher, to be our guide. And uh, we know that if we are blessed by what is said here today, it is only because of you and because of what you have done. And Lord, we thank you for the truth of the gospel, that it is powerful, that it changes lives, that it saves people not only from their sin, but also from uh, a, a life of torment here on earth. And it's amazing what I've seen just from a country that has absolutely no Christian foundation to come back home to America and to see just how blessed we truly are here in America. I thank you and I praise you for that. And so, Lord, above and beyond this, we know that um, even though sometimes, uh, uh, though we're saved, though uh, as Christians we're saved, sometimes life is still hard. Uh, and you don't just save us and then forget about us. You still love us. And we can cast our cares upon you. And you comfort us in our times of trial. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for everything that you've done. So please bless us now. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, thank you. Please be seated. So um, I want to preach to you a message this morning entitled Dealing with Disappointment. And uh, there's obviously so many different Things I could have preached on uh, under the topic of missions or, the, or just preaching the gospel, things like that. But I wanted to touch on disappointment because maybe one of uh, uh, the things that is the biggest challenge in the ministry that I have found in the short time that I have been in the ministry is dealing with disappointment. Uh, life is disappointing. We've all had disappointments. Things don't go our way. Um, and life goes on, and you've got to have a way to deal with it. And I mentioned briefly about the Thai mindset and how their religion is lacking uh, in forgiveness and things like that. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've heard it said, and I've honestly thought myself, I don't know how it is that lost people get through life, you know? I mean, how do they do it? You know, I mean, w without Christ to if you will, cast our cares upon without that hope that we have that, you know what, in the end, it's all going to work out. We win. In the end, we win no matter what happens. Uh, you know, though we lose family members, though we lose opportunities or things like that, we'll see them hopefully again in heaven, you know, if they were saved and things like that. So it's like, even though it looks like things are over, it's not over. Uh, but there are still times of discouragement. So if you would, let, let me uh, read to you this little... Um, my introduction here about discouragement. Listen to this example of disappointment. Some onlookers thought it was unusual, but few noticed when the pastor wheeled into the church parking lot in a borrowed pickup truck. But everyone's eyes were upon him when he backed the truck across the lawn to his study door. Refusing comment or assistance, he began to empty his office onto the truck bed. He was impassive and systematic. First the desk drawers, then the files. And last, his library of books, which he tossed carelessly into a heap, many of them flopping askew like slain birds. His task done, the pastor left the church and, as was later learned, drove some miles to the city dump, where he committed everything to the waiting garbage. It was his way of putting behind him the overwhelming sense of failure and loss that he had experienced in the ministry. This young, gifted pastor was determined never to return to the ministry, Indeed, he never did. So there will be times of disappointment in our lives. 
How do we deal with it in a way that does not result in our quitting on something we should not quit, like this pastor did? And if I could, I just want to share a quick uh, personal story about something like this. You know, obviously, uh, this church here, our church here, has been used by God instrumentally in uh, even uh, me still being in the ministry, if you will, anything going on. I mean, some of you know my history more than others, and I'm not going to go into details, but there was definitely a time when I was ready to quit and on the precipice of quitting. And through the providence of God, I can still remember after we came here, we visited, and uh, the church, a bunch of people from church went out to Flubs, I think is what it's called. Where is that over on maybe North Side or something like that? I can't remember where it is, man. How do you get there? I want to go now. But anyway, uh, we went out, out for ice cream afterwards uh, on a Sunday night. And it was there. We were just sitting down. I can remember, man, these kids were so small. I remember you kids, you were catching fireflies with my kids. They're running around catching fireflies. And it was there that Pastor Head said to me, he was like, we just want to help. We just want to help. Why don't you just come over here? I know things are looking bad. I know it looks like you're out of the ministry, like nothing's going to work for you, that it's over. Just, we just want to help. And you know, just that little bit of encouragement, look at where it's gone now. Look at where it's gone now. Now here we are, we're getting ready to go back for our second term in Thailand. And uh, many of you this morning heard about all of those things. So disappointment is a problem. Disappointment is, uh, is dangerous. Disappointment sometimes is more than enough to get us to quit when if we would have just kept going, we would have had success. And so how do, we, how do we deal with this in our lives? Let's talk about this today. So the first thing I want to talk about is demonic disappointment. Demonic disappointment. So notice in our text in 1 Peter 5, we're still there. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Our text was casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. That is, a fascin- that is a fantastic thought. Like we take for granted how amazing this is. Because again, contrast that with Thailand. Buddha doesn't care about you. Buddha doesn't care about anyone. Buddha poofed out of existence according to their, uh, their, um, their theology or whatever you want to call it, their th- way of thinking, right? There is no one who cares about you who is in a position to help you and is all powerful and able to help you with anything in their way of thinking. But for us, we have Christ and he cares about us. And not only does he care about us, not only did he take all of our sin upon him and died for our sins upon the cross, but he takes our cares and our worries and our troubles and we can bring everything to him by prayer and he will help us. But why is it that Peter is encouraging us to cast our cares on Jesus? Well, verse 8 answers this question, where he goes on to say, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So we need to remember that while, I guess, you know, life is good in many ways, and while sometimes we are disappointed and things maybe don't go our way, we have an adversary an enemy who's real and who's really out to get you. And I'm not trying to like make us all paranoid or anything, but we still need to grapple with this fact that there is an enemy who does a very good job of hiding himself and then attacking us in our weakest moments. And he uses discouragement and attempts to get us to just quit so he doesn't have to fight anymore. If he can just get us to quit, he wins. Just quit. Just throw up your hands. Just say, forget it. That's out. The devil is one. That's all. And, and if he can do that, of course he's going to do that. Try to get us uh, to do that. So there's a couple of things that Peter recommends for us. First of all, be sober. We need to be sober. Now, this is not talking about uh, alcoholic beverages in this content and not being inebriated, though that's also a good idea. I highly recommend that. Uh, this is More than just that, this idea of sober is the idea of having a sound mind, a clear mind, of of being in control of your ability to think. So you need to be in a position where you are purposeful, if you will, in the ways that you're thinking and what you're doing. Now, what is going to give you a sober mind, a sound mind, a right way of thinking? The Bible. If you read the Bible 
and you know the Bible. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against me. You are on a great path to having a sober mind. You are able to think things through correctly instead of just acting on a whim or acting on impulse. You can sit down for a second and think to yourself, now what, what does the Bible say about this? If you have a disagreement at work or a disagreement with a spouse or something like that, what does the Bible say about this? And it allows us to be sober in our thinking in ways that other people don't. Second, we see vigilant. We need to be vigilant. And this word isn't really used much in uh, common uh, language today, but when I think of this word, I think of a vigil. And a vigil was something that was done, like take, for example, Thailand, of course. Uh, Thailand has a king. There's a king that rules over, and they, of course, have a parliamentary system very similar to England. Uh, but the old king died. And what they did with the body of the old king is they do what they call, they laid him out in state, right? And so what they do is they have the body preserved, and it's uh, kept in a way, uh, I think it was kept at like the palace, the royal palace, for example. Uh, and it's kept in a way so that, you know, because he's the king of a huge country, people can go by and see him, and they have plenty of time. I think they had his body laid in state for like, uh, a year. And one of the things that will be done is you have to have people guard the body. You have to have someone, and what this was called is it was standing a vigil. And this vigil could be both symbolic or it could be practical. So you have actual bodyguards because when the king's laid in state, he's not, uh, he's laid in state in all of his royal garb, which, which is like full gold or something like that. They don't want people coming by and, and robbing the body, right? So you have somebody who's guarding it. Uh, but also, very commonly, the son of the king, especially the son who would then be, become the next king, will do what's called stand a vigil, will stand and guard the body. Again, this is mostly symbolic. There's real bodyguards that are actually guarding it. Uh, but he would stand there to do that. And that is a vigil. And so the idea is then that you have to keep at it, okay? Because a vigil is, is usually you stand a vigil. I think they would do like an overnight vigil for a symbolic sort of show to show uh, how you know, important it was to, to guard the king. And of course, the body is protected 24 seven. So you have to be vigilant. You have to be there all the time. You have to be on it. Now, that's hard. It's hard to be on the guard all the time. It's hard to have to like always be thinking like the devil's out to get me. I need to make sure I do right. When I talk to people, I need to season my speech with salt and grace and things like, you know, that's hard to do sometimes. So that's another reason why we have verse 7, cast your cares upon him. Pray to God and pray to Christ to help you to be both sober and vigilant. But we need to be because our adversary, the devil, our enemy, the one who is against us, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And so the devil is very commonly in scripture referred to as, uh, as coming and going like in Job. He was going up and down the earth or he's walking about. And it's interesting that Peter uses as a roaring lion in this verse, because I'm not sure if the Roman Colosseum was even open yet at the time of this. I mean, I know that they were persecuting Christians and killing Christians, but the lions may have been years after Peter's death. I'm not sure. So he's, he's either speaking from experience, because I know Peter, I'm pretty sure Peter was martyred in Rome, uh, or, well, this is the first epistle though, so yeah, or he's, uh, it's, it's almost prophetic is really what it is when you think about it, how the Roman emperors would use lions in the Colosseum to literally eat Christians and kill Christians, how, how wild that is. That's the devil, and that's, that's a picture of the devil. And so we need to be sure to resist him because the devil is real and he's really out to get you. And if you're not saved, if you're here today and you're not saved, you know the devil's already got you. He's already got you tied up and confused and, and lied to, and uh, you have no hope if you're not saved. And so if you're not here today and you're not saved, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, proving he's the Son of God and that he has the power to forgive sins. And then Jesus can keep you from the devil. He's not going to keep you from every problem. You may still have problems and things in your life, but he will keep you from uh, the devil, he can protect you in that regard. But if you are saved, the devil has to and will try every trick in the book to keep you down. So what's your weak point? Do you even know what your weak point is? You know, when I was ordained, I remember uh, there was an old pastor, and he, uh, as they were, he was praying over me, he whispered in my ear, he said, 
You know, there's two things. Maybe he said three. I hope he didn't say three because I can't remember the third one. But he said there's two things that the devil will use to get a man. Money and women. Right? Now, that can mean a whole lot of things, too. There can be specific little, little things like that. But you got to be careful. you got to guard yourself. you got to watch out for these sort of things. Because the devil will use every trick in the book to get you down. If you don't know your weaknesses, uh, you can ask your wife. <laughs> or you can, if you're really brave, maybe, maybe don't do that. Maybe don't do that. You can ask your husband. Maybe don't do that. But you can ask, maybe a good friend. How about that? Somebody who you're comfortable with. You can ask your friend, right? Uh, if, you, if you don't know. But you should know. You should know where your weaknesses are. And you should know how to guard yourself against these sort of things. And make sure that you don't find yourself in a position where you may end up weak and tempted and unable to stand. And so we know that the devil's after us. But above and beyond this, we make things even more complicated for ourselves. Because we, as people just in general, have all sorts of expectations that go beyond uh, re what we would consider reasonable. And what that can lead to is dangerous disappointment, which is my second point. So let's look back in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 18. We're going to talk about dangerous disappointment and unreasonable expectations. Ezekiel chapter 18, and we're going to look at verse 20. And so we need to be really careful about not being disappointed in certain things. And this is an example of one of the pitfalls that, um, that uh, churches have, especially, and, uh, and Christians in general. And so let's read this verse, and then I'll expound on it. It might be confusing at first, but I'll expound on it, and it'll make sense. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And so there are common expectations, especially amongst Baptist circles, that Christians' children are perfect. Right? We've got common ex And not only that, but the pastor's children are perfect <laughs> and must be perfect. And if they do anything wrong, that it's automatically viewed as a uh, sign that uh, clearly there's something going wrong. Oh, did you hear that? That uh, the so-and-so son did this? Oh man, their, their house is probably all messed up and things like that, right? Well, that's not the case. Look, the, I mean, the Bible clearly says the father shall bear the sin of the father, the son shall bear the sin of the son. So we need to remember that kids are not perfect, they're kids. And that they're people and they make their decisions too. And that there's plenty of times where although children have grown up in a Christian home and received all of the proper instruction and they've sat under good preaching their entire life, they still go off and make mistakes. And what happens is this sort of thing sometimes leads to crippling disappointment. Because it's, I, I understand if you have a, a child that say is a black sheep or something like that, it maybe may feel like, oh man, I just, I don't know if I can serve the Lord the same way. Well, you, we've got to remember it's on them, especially if they're an adult, it's on them. It's on them. Now, when the kids are little and they're, you know, they're in my house, my kids are in my house, obviously it's my responsibility to correct my children and to Send, uh, teach them properly and things like that. But kids are going to grow up and then they're going to go do what they're going to do. And I'm not saying that's okay. That's not okay. But that doesn't mean that there needs to be this sort of unproper expectation on my part that if things don't go exactly the way I want them to go, that therefore, oh, now I'm crushed in disappointment and I'm not able to serve the Lord anymore. So if a parent does their duty and their kid turns out bad, whose fault is it? Who's fault? I'm not talking about a bad parent that does a bad job and then their kids have problems and things like that. Obviously, there are bad parents and that can lead to bad kids. But I'm talking about good parents, good Christian parents, and they do everything right and they take their kid to church and they're faithful and they're doing all this. And then just for whatever reason, that kid goes off and just isn't serving the Lord. Should, whose fault is that? Again, when they're adults, the Bible says it's the kid's fault. The father shall not bear the sin of the son. The son shall not bear the sin of the father. The soul that sinneth it should die, right? So we need to be careful about this crippling disappointment. Think of it this way, if you're not convinced. Think of it this way. God had a son who turned out bad. I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about Adam. 
right? God created Adam, made him perfect, gave him Eve. She was perfect. They're in the garden. Everything's perfect. And yet Adam still sinned against God, though he had absolutely no uh, reason to do it. He had every single advantage that he could have had to keep him following God. So sometimes it just happens. And so don't let things like this, disappointments with your family, disappointments with kids, disappointments with parents, with whatever, don't let those things cripple you to the point where you're like, oh, I just can't serve God now. I'm just so disappointed. I'm so destroyed. No, let's not do that. And so secondly, in dangerous disappointment, we need to be careful about how we define success, okay? We need to define success God's way. As Americans, I see this now more clearly, having lived in a foreign country as long as I have. As Americans, we are like obsessed with success with, and, and we define it in such weird ways. You know, the world generally defines success by money. If you got money, you're successful. If you don't have money, you're not successful. Uh, you know, if you're famous, then usually you have money too, and you're then you're considered successful. Or if you are in power politically or something like that, then you're successful. And that's generally how uh, the world defines it. But God does not define success in the way that man in general defines it. Because think about this. When Christ died on the cross, what did the world see? The world saw a colossal failure, right? From the world's point of view, here's some carpenter from the backwoods of, of uh, Galilee, and he gets this following, and he's got a couple hundred people that are following him, and he marches into Jerusalem, and everyone's shouting hosannas, and then what is it, three days later, a couple days later, boom, he's executed by Rome. As far as the world's considered, done deal, it's over. Nothing, nothing to see here, right? He's a complete and total failure, just like all of the other guys. Remember, there was a bunch of false messiahs in that day. Uh, the Bible talks about it. I think it was Gamaliel steps up in Acts and mentions a couple of them. There were people that had drawn crowds to go and follow them, and then the same thing happened. They died, Rome killed them, or something like that, and it just peters out and stuff. And so from the world's point of view, that's business as usual. You get some charismatic leader, he steps up, he says the wrong thing, Rome kills him, no big deal. Still happens today. Man, it happened, what was that? Uh, I'm not even going to talk about it, but it happened here in America not too long ago, and uh, in my lifetime. And so, what, but what God saw, what God saw on that day, though everybody there saw failure, there was not a person there when Jesus died on the cross who was there at the crucifixion who thought, this is great. No one thought that when it was happening. No one was jumping up with joy. The devil and his devils were the ones who were rejoicing at that time. They were the ones who were like, yeah, we won, we did it. But there wasn't anybody who thought that it was great. It was only until after the resurrection and then, and then after that, that people started to realize, and Jesus started to teach them that they started to realize exactly what happened. It was only God who saw the propitiation on the cross that day, that day. And so in our lives, there may be times where we have events and we think, oh, man, that didn't go right. Oh, man, that was a total failure. Oh, man, why did, you know, I felt like the Lord was leading me here and to go and do this and Nothing worked out right. And then we find out years later that the Lord used it. And the Lord used it in a way that we would never and never could have understood. So let's take a look at Isaiah. Let's think about this from uh, Jesus' perspective. We'll look at Isaiah, the prophetic, uh, Isaiah 53, the prophetic writing. Isaiah chapter 53. And uh, this... This section here about the suffering servant really starts in Isaiah chapter 52. I think back uh, about verse 13, and so it speaks of the suffering servant. And then, uh, you know, it goes on about how nobody would desire him in verse 2, and no one esteemed him in verse 3, and he was stricken, and then he died. And in verse 10, we see, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And so what is that talking about? I'm sure you've heard sermons on this before, so I won't belabor the point. But of course, as Jesus is dying on the cross, as many have said before, Jesus could, in a sense, see all of the people that he knew would be saved from what he was doing. 
And though dying on the cross is a huge discouragement to anybody and suffering like Jesus had to suffer was not something that he wanted to do from you know, a fleshly point of view, Jesus understood that the temporary suffering that he would face there, of course, uh, there was eternal suffering in, in, uh, in a schism in the Godhead sort of sense, which I cannot explain, but that's okay. <laughs> um, the, 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 the suffering in that time on the cross would be worth it. It would be worth it because of all the people who, uh, all of the elect, he would claim all of his elect through it. And so verse 11 says, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. See, Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew what was going on. He knew that he was dying as the sacrifice, as our sin sacrifice on that cross for the sin of all of the elect, for the many, for his people. And verse 12 says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So again, from the world's point of view, total failure. Nothing to see here. Nothing happened. Just another guy getting executed. No big deal. Nobody would have ever thought anything again. But the third day he rose again. And that was a game changer. And that has been a game changer. 2,000 years later, here we are, we're still talking about it. And we're sending people all over the world to tell people about it still to this day, how amazing that is. And so what looked like a complete and total abject failure in that moment is now the greatest story ever told, still being told all around the world. And Christianity is still, if you will, uh, the gospel is still going forth with power. Christianity is still the fastest growing religion, uh, I think uh, I heard, in uh, the world to, in this at this time. And so Christ knew he would suffer and yet was not disappointed, right? So sometimes we're going to suffer. And the thing that's interesting about this, again, we can cast our cares on Christ. So we're suffering. We're going through tough times. Things are not going our way. You know, we have questions. God, why are you doing it this way? Okay, what do I do? Just cast it on Christ right now. I don't know. I don't know what to do. So I'll cast it to Christ. Lord, you've just got to help me. You've got to help me deal with this and get through it. And you can just cast him. Just leave it there for now. And then you know what will happen one day? That'll come back and it'll be like, boom, okay, here. This is why this happened. This is why things are going this way. This is what I did with it. And if you just trust him and you keep going and you don't get discouraged and you don't quit, you'll find out that God will use your suffering in ways that you could have never imagined to bring forth a blessing in ways that you could have never foreseen or predicted. So he knew that success was not in what the world saw, but in doing the will of his Father in heaven. And if I can talk about suffering one more time, again, to contrast the worldview of uh, the country that we live in in Thailand and the worldview of the Christian worldview, suffering is something that God uses in the Christian worldview to bring forth fruit, okay? Suffering is a part of life. We don't like it, but we suffer it, right? We have, we have to suffer it sometimes. And as Christians, though we're saved, we're saved from our sins, we're not saved from suffering in this life still. There are still things that we have to suffer. And they may be terrible heartbreaks is the point I'm trying to make. Something like, a, again, a wayward child or a, a lost family member or, a, or people dying and, and losing your job, losing things like that. We may still suffer these things. But God can use that in ways we can't understand. Now, contrast that with Buddhism, which teaches that suffering is the absolute worst thing ever. The entire purpose of Buddha, and when he went and sat in a forest and meditated for years, was to solve the problem of suffering. Now, this is maybe the thing that we need to understand. There's no problem. There's no problem. You, it doesn't need to be fixed. It's working as intended, right? You ever heard that? Working as intended. Suffering is doing what God wants it to do in our lives. It's not easy. It's not fun. I don't want to have to go through it. I don't want to have discouragement and have to fight the devil and have to go through all of these things. But God knows I need it when I need it. And when I can't take it and I'm a crybaby and like Pastor Holt said, the wife's gone and he's sick and he's all alone for two days and he's a cry, crying in his pillow and stuff. You got to give it to the Lord, man. 
You're just like, you know what? This is all you, man. This is all you, Lord. This is it. I just, I can't do it. I'm a baby. And, you know, I, I feel you, brother. I'm the same way you can do uh, My wife's laughing at me. She knows. She knows. We, so I say, I can dish it out, but I can't take it, right? That's what we say. I, I can dish it out. I get up here, I preach these sermons, right? It's like, oh, I got all the answers. Nah, and then I go home and I'm crying in my little babe. I don't know what to do. Oh, just pray. Just pray. That's, you know, praise God for uh, a godly wife because that is, she, she's always got to remind me. Like, you would think I would know that by now, right? She's always got to remind me. Just pray. Just pray. Like, yes, yes, you're right. We'll pray. All right, so. Christ knew he would suffer. We knew success. Uh, he knew success was not in what the world saw, but in doing the will of his father. So there is no uh, solution to suffering. We will suffer in this life, but God will use it. And we need to trust by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. So that brings us to our final point. And I'll wrap this up. Disregarding disappointment. Disregarding disappointment. So let's uh, jump uh, uh, to Hebrews really quick. Hebrews chapter 12. Just got two more verses. And uh, Pastor Holt called me up this morning, and he asked me, Brother, what kind of pizza do you like in Cincinnati? And I think without missing a beat, I was like, La Rosa's. <laughs> I want La Rosa. I had forgotten La Rosa's existed until he asked that question, and I was like, oh, there's La Rosa's here. I must have. So I think we have La Rosa's pizza coming. So if you weren't going to stay, now, now you have to uh, because it's La Rosa's. But Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse three and four, we're going to take a look at this disregarding disappointment, right? We want to disregard it. We will be disappointed. We will suffer. We will have things go wrong, but we need to be able to move through these discouragements and keep serving the Lord. And how are we going to do that? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse three and four says, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So look, we're not dead yet. We haven't done what Christ has done and died on the cross for people. You know, it, no matter what it is that we're going through, it's not as bad as what Jesus did for you, right? He paid for your sins. He's, he's taken all of that hell, all of that torment, all of that punishment that you did and you deserve, and he took it upon himself willingly and died and paid that price for that. And so no matter what it is that I go through in this life, it pales in comparison to what he's already done for me. And so you're still alive, which means that there's always a chance for recovery, right? So even if things look bad right now, there's a lot of things that can be lost, but they can be recovered. I mean, think about your health. Maybe you've had a health downturn at some point. You've been really sick and it looked like you were gonna die maybe. I don't know, but you recovered right? Or you can, you can, you can recover. Or there are people and they have made millions. They've gotten all this wealth. And then you know what they do? They lose it. <laughs> and they lose all their wealth. And then they get it back again, right? Or you've got people uh, that have uh, uh, relationships. You know, you can have a relationship and your relationships, oh man, they don't go well. You have a child that say again, is a black sheep and he goes off and he's not serving the Lord. Well, you know what? The Lord may bring him back. He may get saved and then start serving God. And that's That you've done, if you've done it for the Lord, is a loss of time. And do not let disappointment turn into discouragement, and then discouragement into depression, and depression into defeat. Because again, that's what Satan wants. He just wants you to quit. Just quit. It's easier, right? We always think it's easier. What are we going to do? We're going to quit. You know, I think, I, I did hear a pastor say once, you know, if you're going to quit Sunday night, that's fine. Quit as a pastor. Just re-enlist Monday morning. Right. And, and, I, and that, that's kind of true. I mean, there were so many times when we were on deputation that after, the, you know, the full day of having to drive however many miles and go to some church and pick up and drive and go to another church and then go. And then by Sunday night, it's like, I'm done, man. I quit. I can't do this anymore. You know, and you go to bed and then you wake up Monday morning and you realize, OK, we've got to keep going and stuff like that. So don't let that discouragement turn into quitting. So our final verse, Second Timothy, Second Timothy 2.12.
Because again, this is the thing that we need to remember when we're thinking about disappointment and suffering and all of these things. 2 Timothy 2.12 tells us, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Okay, so let's just look at the first part of verse 12 there. We're just going to talk about that. I'm not going to go into anything more than that. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. What an amazing promise. Again, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it in any other religion. There's nothing like that. Buddha doesn't suffer with you. Buddha doesn't care about you. Buddha doesn't know you exist. Uh, he, and he's not going to reign. They call him the Lord Buddha. They are mistaken, <laughs> right? They are very mistaken. Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is coming back. And boy, does it look more and more every single day like he's coming back sooner and sooner. Like, I still can't believe he hasn't come back yet with the way the world keeps shaping up, right? But Jesus is coming back. And when he does, he will rule and reign and we will reign with him. And all of the things that we went through, all of the disappointments, all of the trials, all of the struggles, We'll be like, wow, that was nothing. That was easy. Boy, that, was, that wasn't even worth my time. And the glorious reward that we will have ruling and reigning with him will be far beyond our imagination. We can't even imagine it. The Bible says that. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things that he has prepared for us. So to conclude, disappointment is unfortunately a reality that we will always have to live with on this side of eternity. There is no temporal victory that can ensure that you will never be disappointed again, okay? You probably will experience disappointment in your life again or, or some, at some time again, but with the exception of what? Calvary. Calvary was the, uh, the victory. So how much more, with how much more force, does our text deliver hope for whatever may befall us? Though you may have been disappointed in many things, the Lord Jesus Christ cares and he will make all things right one day. So let's pray and uh, then, uh, or Pastor Holt, do you want to you come up? Or you want me to pray? Yeah, why don't you come